Um, thanks for having me. Uh, we'll talk about the management of local advanced and metastatic gastric cancer. Uh, so we'll, uh, by way of overview, I'll start with the background on the uh, TCGA data, the Cancer Genome Atlas data that was recently published in Nature uh, on gastric cancer. And I'll shift gears and talk about the standard approach for localized disease, for metastatic disease, uh, and finalize our discussion on molecular targets and some of these uh, challenges that we need to overcome, particularly for HER2-targeted uh, agents, VEGF, uh, CMAT and uh, the uh, PD-1 uh, uh, directed therapy. So gastric cancer worldwide is a major health issue, over a million cases diagnosed, uh, and the incidence uh, surpasses lung cancer or breast cancer. In U.S., however, it's relatively rare, uh, but even with that, there are uh, enough data to suggest that the uh, incidence of certain subtypes of gastric cancer is on the rise particularly the G-junction adenocarcinomas, uh, and uh, this recent paper uh, in 2010 in JAMA suggesting that even non-G-junction or non-cardia tumors, uh, so distal gastric cancers are on the rise, particularly in a very young uh, adult population uh, among ages 25 to 39. And I'll consider 39 very young, so. Uh, <laughs> Seventy percent increase in incidence of non-cardia uh, gastric tumors. And the authors, you know, brought up some hypotheses as to why this occurs. Obviously, uh, the risk of uh, increase with obesity, um, you know, uh, uh, exposure to inflammatory uh, factors, uh, but maybe uh, something as simple as uh, immigration patterns uh, from Eastern Europe and Asia that have affected this uh, trend. Gastric cancer in young folks is relatively rare, but uh, there are these uh, diffused hereditary gastric cancer syndrome, which is driven by the uh, gen uh, a germline alteration in CDH1 gene. Uh, this is the only time I'll be talking about germline alterations, uh, but it's 80% penetrance, uh, meaning that you're 80% uh, uh, likely to get the uh, tumor uh, in your stomach if you have the uh, germline alteration. And, and we can't really screen uh, for this ca type of ca cancer well, and so uh, prophylactic gastrectomy is, is recommended. Uh, these uh, patients are also at risk for lobular-type uh, breast cancer. The Cancer Genome Atlas has really put on the map uh, what we've uh, suspected phenotypically uh, and histologically, that gastric cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. There is this uh, you know, diffuse versus intestinal histology. There are the different outcomes between the Asian countries versus the West. You know, all of this data has been out there. And then the Cancer Genome Atlas is the effort through the NCI to characterize these tumors in a systematic way. And so 295 specimens, these were primary tumors, untreated, so never received chemotherapy or radiation uh, from uh, multiple centers uh, that were examined. And the, the, they are being very uh, thoroughly annotated and interrogated by whole exome sequencing on the DNA level, uh, by uh, mRNA, microRNA profiling, uh, protein and methylation. Uh, so this is a very sort of thorough uh, look at the tumor uh, biology. And, in, and as Dr. Marshall br brought up, I mean, the quality of the tissue is very important. So the DNA quality uh, was very high um, in, the, in this subset. And as you can see, 295 uh, specimens were examined. And uh, through the bioinformatics analysis, there were four distinct subtypes of gastric cancer that uh, were characterized. Uh, I will start with EBV subtype because that's sort of, even though they're more rare, but very uh, genomically provocative and unique subtype. Uh, and it only occurs in about 9% of the patients. Uh, the MSI or hypermutated tumors, 24% of the patients. And when I say MSI, I don't mean Lynch syndrome, you know, hypermutated. These are somatic alterations, not germline. And they happen uh, on whole exome that you see 500, 600 gene mutations. And they're not targetable genes per se. It just uh, shows a vulnerability of the tumor uh, and an ability to repair DNA damage. 
Chromosomically, uh, chromosomally stable or genomically stable tumors, 20%. Uh, and then the largest uh, uh, piece of the pie is chromosomal uh, instable or hyper aneuploid tumors. And I included this picture right here to give you a sense of that it's not uh, sufficient now to say, well, I, you know, I know that signet ring cell type gastric cancer is very different from uh, G junction tumors, and anatomically we can figure out how to target them better. As you can see by this colored coding, the uh, chromosomally unstable tumors, for example, the purple, can happen in the cardi and G junction, but also in the body and the pyloric region. Uh, and the EBV tumors also can happen, you know, mostly in the uh, body, but also different parts of the uh, of the uh, anatomic locations. So the chromosomally unstable tumors is probably what you and I see most in clinic. These are RTK or receptor tyrosine kinase driven tumors. So when you're thinking about HER2 amplifications, EGFR amplifications, MET, you know, PI3 kinase alterations, those things uh, amplification wise occur in these, you know, uh, proximal tumors. The EBV subtype, again, very interesting, 80% of them were PI3 kinase mutant and their drugs, uh, you know, in breast cancer and other cancers under development, and so, uh, which we could bring to clinic and gastric cancer. This is the subtype probably that we should focus on for immunotherapies. Uh, they are PDL1 over, so program death receptor uh, ligand 1 and 2, you probably just heard about in melanoma. You know, it's a, a very uh, big market now, and there's um, disease specific studies in gastric now showing a benefit. And so is um, MSI tumors. So these tumors, because they're so hyper mutated, uh, they present a lot of new antigens, and they're uh, particularly uh, good ones to target for immunotherapies. The genomically stable subtype is going to be a challenge. These are silent tumors, and now that we're doing genomic characterizations of these tumors in clinic, literally, you'll get a report, um, and it's unlike what you just saw from Dr. Marshall, where there is nothing uh, reported. Uh, but interestingly, 30 percent of those are ROA mutant. ROA is a, a RAS-associated protein, but there's some labs um, at, uh, that are specifically focused on developing uh, drugs to target that alteration. So these uh, next generation sequencing assays are real, and you know there are uh, many commercially available entities that will uh, uh, sequence the tumor for the patients. At MSKCC, we uh, routinely sequence every patient with metastatic gastric cancer that comes to my clinic. They get consented under institutional tissue procurement protocols and uh, get uh, screened for 340 alterations. Uh, so we're looking at genomic on the, on the DNA level for amplifications, deletions, um, and mutations. Um, and as you can see, you know, the, the reason why we're doing this, this is not prime time for standard therapy for most patients because you can pick up a HER2 amplification on fish. Uh, but these are done as a roadmap as to what are the next generation of trials? What kind of agents should I be studying in clinic? Um, and as suspected, at least in our patient population, the aneuploid or hyperamplified tumors is what we're dealing with. As you can see, a lot of receptor tyrosine kinase targets. P53 is a big uh, problem, and it's pretty much not targetable. But even with P53 mutation, uh, you know, co-occurrence of EGFR, HER2, HER3 alterations uh, will likely be a, a possible target. Well, the majority of our patients present with locally advanced disease, uh, and the problem is that with, you know, with the depth of tumor invasion, uh, the deeper the tumor goes, this is the picture uh, summarizing the AGCC10 staging, the deeper the tumor invasion, the highly likelihood of lymph node metastasis and micrometastatic disease, which is eventually what kills our patients. Within uh, G junction, we subdivide uh, the uh, location of the tumor by uh, Seward classification. Uh, and uh, the Seward 3 tumors are essentially approached as gastric cancer uh, surgically. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, the paradigm is for to treat them with perioperative therapy and surgery. For Seward 1 and 2 tumors, those are approached at least for localized disease as esophageal tumors. Well, localized disease uh, surgery is the only cure, and we can't uh, underscore enough the importance of good, experienced surgeons, and there's a lot of data to suggest that 
the more cases a surgeon does, the better outcome for the patients, and this needs to be a good cancer surger, uh, surgeon. So you can't have a bariatric surgeon uh, do a gastrectomy around the patient and then come back you know, with three lymph nodes sampled, and then the patients come to you in the clinic and say, please cure me. Um, you know, so uh, importance of a good operation cannot be replaced by anything. Uh, and finding the disease early improves the chances for surgery. The staging is endoscopy, CT scan, and PET scan. And patients who are not clinically presenting with symptoms or uh, bulky disease that you can see on an CT, an EOS will help you delineate uh, involvement of the lymph nodes. Laparoscopy is also an important tool, as a lot of these patients have microchromatostatic disease that will not be picked up even on high-resolution scans. Probably more than 50% of our patients present with surgical, uh, uh, with metastatic disease. And uh, at that point, systemic chemotherapy is only palliative and intent. But even when people who present with locally advanced resectable tumors, the five-year survival with our best surgeons' aggressive therapy remains dismal, less than 20%. And this is what we really need to focus on, early detection and optimization of staging and treatment. Staging with a PET scan uh, helps uh, to pick up 15% of occult metastatic disease in uh, lymph nodes, retroperitoneal and supraclavicular lymph nodes that were not apparent on uh, other cross-sectional imaging. Also, the PET scan will help you determine the tumor biology and sensitivity of chemotherapy in preoperative setting. Uh, this is the Municon uh, data that I'm referring to, but I won't have time to re uh, uh, review. Essentially, if the PET scan is getting better with chemotherapy in a preoperative setting, and the definition is 30% or more decrease in the SUV, it's a, 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 it heralds better outcome with surgery and chemotherapy. The consensus on adjuvant chemotherapy is that no matter what you de decide to do, perioperative adjuvant uh, chemo or chemo RT, the overall survival improvement is approximately 13% at five years. And so anything you decide to do is justifiable, uh, and here are some of the uh, some guidelines. So pre-op uh, pre uh, chemotherapy with epirubicin, cisplatin, 5-FU, or a combination of a fluoropyrimidine and a platinum is what's favored in Europe and most of academic centers in U.S., uh, and if in patients who have had surgery first and may have not had a very good lymph node dissection or adequate uh, uh, disease control locally, adjuvant chemoradiation therapy can also be considered. In Asia, uh, uh, surgery first followed by adjuvant chemotherapy and maybe surgery is the preferred uh, approach. The consensus is that something more than surgery needs to be done for local advanced disease. It almost doesn't matter what you do. It, it, anything you decide to do clinically is defendable by level one evidence, and you just need to do something more than surgery to help control micrometastatic disease. Preoperative chemotherapy improves overall survival. This is the magic data, 13% at five years, but no clear impact on our zero resection rate. Post-op chemo RT also improves uh, overall survival in a similar fashion. Intergroup 116 study showed that. The artist uh, study demonstrated that even in adjuvant chemotherapy, even with good lymph node dissection, D2 uh, lymph node dissection, uh, addition of radiation therapy in certain subsets is useful. And finally, if you have a frail patient in whom you do not feel comfortable doing combination therapy or chemo RT, one can justify just using single-agent capecitabine, as that's probably the most sort of bang for your buck. So what about role of D2 lymph node dissection? Historically, the difference between survival between east and west was uh, attributed to inadequate operation or uh, lymphadenectomy that's performed in uh, U.S. and other western countries. Uh, but since the long-term follow-up of the Dutch uh, trial uh, became available, D2 lymph node dissection, and, and pictorially you can see here the, uh, the brown lymph nodes here around the perigastric lymph nodes either is the D1 dissection. Addition of the green lymph nodes is the D2 dissection. And I have to tell you that the classic D2 lymph node dissection also takes the spleen, which really increases the morbidity and post-op complications. So, in, at Memorial, for example, and some other academic centers, uh, we do what's called modified D2, where the spleen is left behind um, and the outcome is, uh, is less morbid. Uh, overall, survival is improved uh, with uh, more extensive lymph node dissection, and now it's part of the NCCN and the ESMO practice guidelines. 
So just to uh, jump into the trials and show you some of the uh, Kaplan-Meier survival curves, Inst intergroup 116 trial, that's the McDonald uh, New England Journal of Medicine trial, uh, randomized patients to observation after surgery or one could say relatively low doses of 5-FU uh, with the radiation. And here are the survival curves. 20% of the tumors were G-junction, so some of this data is extrapolatable to our uh, proximal tumor uh, uh, patients. Uh, and chemoradiation was clearly better than surgery alone. But uh, the uh, criticism of this trial is that only 10% of the patients had a D2 lymph node dissection. The rationale of neoadjuvant chemotherapy is that you have the tumor in vivo, you can follow the response. You're not just treating theoretically micrometastatic disease that may or may not be sensitive to this chemotherapy. And the patients generally are in better shape before they have a total gastrectomy, obviously. Um, furthermore, you, you know, if you have this one patient who's completely treatment refractory and will develop liver metastasis while on chemotherapy, uh, you're probably sparing them an unnecessary operation. So it's not like you're wasting an opportunity to cure them. You're uh, sparing them an unnecessary operation. So uh, this is uh, you, uh, all the rationales for pre-op chemo. And MAGIC trial has put it on the map in a formal way. This is ECF, so infusional 5-FU, pretty high doses of cysts and, and epirubicin to toxic regimen uh, given uh, every three weeks for three doses in the pre-op setting and three doses adjuvantly uh, versus surgery alone. Overall survival was uh, pretty humbling. Five-year uh, survival rate, even with our best uh, chemotherapy, uh, or at least what we think is the best chemotherapy, is 36%. This is in your curable patient population. Uh, and the uh, experimental, uh, uh, the standard surgery group uh, was 23%. The hazard ratio is statistically significant, and the curves obviously separate, but the toxicity can be quite substantial. So well, what about your typical sort of 75-year-old patient who you don't really feel uh, could take a three-drug combination, uh, well, and, or they already had a surgery and they're coming to see you to discuss adjuvant therapy? So the classic uh, data, and this is a, a study that was performed in uh, Korea, uh, China, and Taiwan all, only, so you, know, you sort of extrapolate to the Western patients with a, uh, a little bit of hesitancy, but everyone had a D2 lymph node dissection, so good um, post-operative study, and patients were randomized to receive chemotherapy with capecitabine oxaliplatin uh, versus observation. And the survival, disease-free survival and the overall survival which was recently updated, uh, are statistically significant. With, again, you see the trend here. It's not you know, um, that, that different from uh, anything that uh, Intergroup 116 or the MAGIC trial has shown. And again, if, you, if that 75-year-old has neuropathy from his diabetes or is just not fit enough for two drugs, uh, you could just do single-agent 5-FU or, or um, Zolota for probably just as much of a benefit, which was uh, reviewed at a meta-analysis in JAMA in 2010. Well, what about if the patient had a good lymph node dissection? You sampled you know, 30 lymph nodes. You had uh, uh, more chemotherapy, so you decided to do CAPE. Uh, cysts or capecitabine oxaliplatin in an adjuvant setting, would addition of radiation therapy after that point help? Uh, you know, there's hypotheses that you're sterilizing the tumor bed um, and uh, helping uh, disease, uh, you know, to stay at bay. Well, the bottom line that this artist study looked at it, and in the pre-planned subgroup analysis, where 396 lymph node positive patients were analyzed, only in lymph node positive disease was there a benefit. But as you can see, the curves were in that, uh, they were very close together. But if you further look down in the intestinal subtype, so 163 patients with an intestinal subtype, the difference in the three-year uh, disease-free survival was uh, more uh, robust and the curves look uh, uh, more separated. And again, the way that I would think about it is if uh, you have an intestinal subtype gastric cancer with no positive disease and the patient is fit, you could consider adjuvant chemoradiation after four months of KPOX. It's a large radiation field. They've already been through a lot. So I can tell you, in my personal practice, I've, I do it very rarely uh, and only in very fit patients. Well, what about systemic uh, chemotherapy for metastatic disease? 5-FU cisplatin is the, uh, the workhorse and what we build on. 20% uh, response rate, only eight months overall survival benefit in historic trials. Addition of a third drug, either with anthracycline, such as epirubicin or taxane, docetaxel, 
has been shown to be uh, improved in a response rate, but very uh, minimal and modest overall survival uh, at a cost of high toxicity. In fact, CLGB 80403 study has suggested that perhaps Folfox, a more modern way of, t of giving these two drugs, is sufficient and not even uh, any uh, less efficacious than a ECF, epirubicin, cisplatin, 5-FU. HER2 has really been the first uh, validated target in metastatic uh, setting, and trastuzumab is FDA approved based on the TOGA trial with overall survival unprecedented 16 months overall survival in that trial. And VEGFR2 targeting with remosurumab has now been validated. Well, what about doing nothing? What, what will, um, in, you know, I'm sure you get asked that in clinic all the time, doc, what, how much do I have if I don't do anything, if I just walk away? And the overall survival is approximately three months without, with best supportive care. And there's enough trials that show that the quality of life, the duration of life overall is improved with systemic chemotherapy. And this is some of the data demonstrating that. So we know that uh, one drug is better than nothing, two drugs is better than one, and you hear all the time the uh, experts uh, argue about, well, what, what will addition of a third drug uh, add? And uh, here's basically, you know, some of the summary. The SPIRITS trial looked at a oral form of 5-FU, which is S1, with S1 in chemotherapy, and there's uh, overall survival benefit. Again, this is uh, an Asian study, so as you can see, the survival benefit uh, is looking pretty good for uh, our Western patients. The uh, V325 study looked at addition of a taxine to two-drug combination and improved response rate very minimum improved overall survival rate, so you would consider this in a very uh, fit uh, but very symptomatic patient with high disease burden. And ECF was compared to FAMTX, which is 5-FU, doxorubicin, and methotrexate. So you can't really say that ECF was that efficacious because you're using a, a very outdated regimen. But in this trial, uh, ECF was uh, the winner. The TAX325 study, here's the survival curves. Again, one year survival actually was uh, much better for uh, the three drug combination, uh, and the response rate is 36.7%, so you would consider that in your metastatic uh, patient who's fit. The REAL2 study demonstrated that uh, cisplatin and oxaliplatin, 5 of you and Zolota, you know, you can use them interchangeably. They're pretty uh, efficacious. Um, CLGB 80403 study is the really uh, good trial to think about when you're considering to do uh, giving ECF. Uh, again, uh, cisplatin and renutecan was the clear loser, but the ECF and Folfox were very similar uh, in terms of progression-free survival, overall survival, um, and median time to progression. Look at this, 6% deaths with ECF. Uh, and uh, the grade three GI toxicities with cisplatin and renutecan were uh, pretty bad as well. So again, you know, we generally, at least I don't use epirubicin in metastatic setting. If I want to use a third drug, I use a taxane. So second line therapy, even in my lifetime as an attending, uh, there have been, you know, very nihilistic approach to use a second line therapy in, uh, in a gastric uh, cancer. But now there's enough data to support it, and we even have a targeted agent approved in um, second line setting. So uh, taxines and irinutecan is what we generally use. They're both equally effective. If you have neuropathy, then you're more likely to use irinutecan, but otherwise a taxine is better tolerated. Biomarkers. Remosurumab is now FDA approved in second line setting. VEGF uh, is the target. Uh, trastuzumab uh, and uh, HER2 is the uh, biomarker companion for trastuzumab based therapy. CMAT, there was a lot of excitement for it. However, there were multiple negative phase three studies, uh, and even MET amplification may not be uh, the way to go to enrich for these patients. EGFR, negative, uh, anti pdl one with pembrolizumab uh, and nivolumab is probably the next sort of uh, exciting frontier in gastric cancer. Just by way of uh, VEGF, bevacizumab, we're not going to review the data, but it was close, but no cigar. It was a negative trial. It's, a ligand, it's an antibody that binds the ligand. Uh, of the VEGFR2, while remosurumab is the monoclonal antibody that actually targets the actual receptor, so slightly different mechanism of action. Apatinib is a, sort of an, a Me Too, another trial that looked at a small uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor that binds and inhibits the activity of VEGFR2 
inside the cell and also was a positive study in China. The REGARD study, this was your pretest question, um, is a randomized study looking at remosuramab, which is the VEGFR2 uh, antibody, uh, versus placebo, and the overall survival benefit was 1.4 months. Um, as you can see here, very modest overall survival benefit. The progression-free survival benefit, 0.8 months, and so even though it was statistically significant, one could argue not very you know, impressive, but even with that, it, it got rapid uh, expedited FDA approval, um, again, because there's very few other targeted agents on the market for gastric. How does it compare to, in, to taxanes? So very, uh, you know, similar single agent, at least uh, disease stabilization and overall survival to docetaxel. No single agent uh, activity with remosuramab, zero responses. So this is a disease stabilizing agent. And the trial really, in, you know, uh, selected patients carefully. No bleed, and no patients with significant bleeding, uh, no, a low volume peritoneal disease. So these are your good players that, uh, you know, that the disease uh, uh, stayed stable. The rainbow study uh, combined remosuramab with paclitaxel, 2.3 months overall survival benefit for addition of remosuramab. Uh, and uh, the progression-free survival benefit was also uh, uh, met. And interestingly, even though remosuramab single agent doesn't have a uh, response rate, when, it, when it's added to chemotherapy, it, has a, uh, it augments chemotherapy and improves response rate. 16% uh, with paclitaxel single agent in second-line setting with 28% uh, in combination with remosuramab. Toxicities were uh, relatively well tolerated. Just one more minute on HER2, which is a, a, my research focus uh, in gastric cancer. So up to a third of uh, uh, esophageal and G-junction tumors are HER2 positive. Herceptin is FDA approved. Uh, trastuzumab is FDA approved in this setting, and there is uh, very little known about mechanisms of resistance. This is the way uh, we test for HER2, uh, immunohistochemistry first for protein, if it's equivocal, then we do gene copy uh, analysis through fluorescent and side 2 hybridization. The TOGA study, and again, you know, echoing what was said in an earlier talk, this was a huge effort by pharma. 3,800 patients were screened for, to identify 810 patients with this rare disease. Majority of the patients were uh, enrolled ex-US, all of them actually. And uh, the patients were randomized to receive chemo uh, plus chemo and TRAS. This is the overall survival benefit, pretty modest in this patient population. Uh, overall, 13.8 versus 11.1. .1. Secondary endpoints uh, were also met, improved response rate and uh, uh, progression-free survival. If you look at it, overall survival in patients, you and I would consider HER2 positive. So the TOGA allowed patients who were IHC0 FISH positive. So, but in IHC2 plus and FISH positive or IHC3 plus, uh, the benefit was quite robust, 16 months overall survival benefit for addition of trastuzumab. What, what we do know about TRAS uh, is, and HER2 is that it's because of gastric cancer heterogeneity and constant change, at the time of trastuzumab progression, uh, up to 20 to 30 percent lose HER2 expression. So this is uh, uh, data from our group, 84 patients with stage 4 HER2 positive adenocarcinoma treated on first-line therapy with TRAS. Overall survival was 20 months, and these patients go on trials, and they get second, third, fourth, fifth-line therapy as long as the functional status uh, remains. Um, and up to a third lose HER2 expression. So this is a trial that we have going on to try to characterize these mechanisms with uh, functional imaging for HER2-directed PET scan and biopsies. This is a trial of single agent afatinib, which is an EGFR HER2, HER3, um, and HER4 inhibitor. Uh, and this is a patient with a heavily pretreated uh, uh, disease, HER2-positive uh, at the time of progression. Um, and response to therapy. What we've tried to develop also a PET scan that is specific to try, you know, uh, to develop these um, um, models of heterogeneity of HER2 expression. Why, you know, why do different sites of metastatic disease uh, respond differently? And you can't really go around and biopsy every spot. Um, and so the trastuzumab radio labeled with zirconium-89 as a radio tracer has been able to shed light on this. So for example, in this patient who is also responding to afatinib, as you can see, the posterior lymph node conglomerate uh, completely went away after just one week of therapy 
while the liver and the G-junction tumors stayed um, the same. And when we biopsied it, the posterior lymph node conglomerate, the HER2 expression went down, but the uh, liver stayed the same. And again, so this is, I'll finish with this scan. What we were able to also image with zirconium PET scan is that com combination of a fat and a with trastuzumab led to a more complete tumor um, regression and downregulation of HER2. This was a patient below that was treated with combination therapy. PDL1 is the, a very interesting target, and pembrolizumab, you've heard uh, some of the data, I'm sure, from Merck, and there will be more to come with immunotherapy uh, uh, in the next uh, few months in gastric cancer. So uh, I know I've covered a lot, but, but there's a lot to talk about now in gastric cancer. This is a good time uh, to be a GI oncologist. So very heterogeneous disease. Uh, a, a lot to be learned about the genomics of it. We know, unfortunately, the majority of the patients, chemotherapy is still the way to go, but at least in second and third line therapy, uh, these clinical trials with genomic, uh, you know, uh, um, annotated tumors should be considered. Very good. Thank you.